everyone, and welcome to our San Diego Comic-Con Education Series panel, How to Choose and Find Graphic Novels for Your Students. Um, we're all excited to be here today. My name is Tracy Edmonds. I'll be the moderator today. I am a former teacher and a current uh, educational writer, and I create resources for teachers to use comics and graphic novels in their classrooms. Uh, I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and also to say, what is your favorite comic? My favorite comic is Hellboy and anything related to that world. I love that world. Jana, would you like to introduce yourself? My name is Jana Tropper. I'm a speech and language pathologist that works with preschool through fifth grade students at a public school in North Aurora, Illinois. I use graphic novels with my students who are in a self-contained special education program. Often we work on inferencing and story comprehension and the visual literacy component. Um, my favorite, I go through phases, but my favorite comic at the moment that I've been rereading, well, reabsorbing a lot is The Arrival by Sean Tan. It is a wordless uh, sequential storytelling work of art. It is, and I have to just throw in there that um... I asked uh, Scott McCloud one time, what is the first book that you would give anyone who has never read a comic or a graphic novel? And he said, The Arrival, because they would not be relying on text. They would be really absorbed in the pictures. So thank you very much, Jana. Christina Taylor. I'm Christina Taylor. I am a school librarian in Texas. I'm also the social media manager for the Young Adult Roundtable of the Texas Library Association and the Vice President of Social Media for Reading with Pictures. Um, <clears throat> my favorite, my new favorite graphic novel is Magic Fish uh, by Chung Li Nguyen. And just, it's phenomenal. The artwork is gorgeous and the sartorial choices and how much storytelling and language plays a role in it. It's just, it's, it's a total package. Excellent, thank you. I need to read that, that sounds amazing. Jillian Ellers, would you like to introduce yourself? Well, yep, I'm Jillian Ellers. I'm a school librarian in Queens at a public school, grades six through 12. I'm also the Japanese culture and manga um, special collections library, librarian, I guess, for New York City schools. And I'm also the president of the New York City School Librarians Association. And I think my favorite manga is Tokyo Ghoul and actually Tokyo Ghoul and the Promised Neverland are like tied for being completely epic. <laughs> awesome, thank you. And Karina. Hi everyone, I'm Karina Kilantan Garza. I'm a middle school library media specialist in the Rio Grande Valley, Texas, uh, predominantly Hispanic area. I currently sit on the Texas Maverick graphic novel reading list committee, uh, which has been a great way to recommend graphic novels to librarians in the state. And when I'm not saving one, I guess, when I'm not saving the world one book at a time, I'm usually found reading comics. So with that being said, my favorite comic as of right now are the Ice Cream Man comics from Image. So uh, I love it because it, they're dark and they're gritty and that's exactly what I need after a long day of children's lit. <laughs> <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Thank you, Karina and Shveta. Hi, everyone. I'm Shavetta Miller. I was a former high school English teacher in New York City Public Schools, where I first started teaching comics and graphic novels. Um, now I'm an instructional coach and literacy specialist here in Oregon uh, for a mid-sized school district here um, near Portland. And I'm the author of Hacking Graphic Novels coming out next month. Um, and I also work with Tracy at Reading with Pictures um, as a director of curriculum. Thank you. Yeah, I forgot to also add that I am the vice president of K-12 education for Reading with Pictures. And Jana is also part of, so it's, it's a bigger, Reading with Pictures is an organization that is dedicated to the furthering the use of comics in education. And so a lot of us uh, volunteer with that group because we believe in this mission so well, so hard. Okay. Um, oh, I, I wanted, wanted to mention my oh, yeah. um, comic graphic novel. Um, I also, it's not necessarily, I, I can't handle questions about favorites, but <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and uh, recommend Good Talk by Mira Jacob. 
Um, I like it because for so many reasons, but one reason is that um, right now I'm really looking for things that push boundaries in the form and the medium. Um, and in this case, uh, this one broaches topics about um, race and identity, um, raising a child in America today. Um, it took place during Trump's America and uh, was really about that talk that you have to you often have to have with your children, especially if you're people of color um, and how we never feel like we're really doing that talk well. And it, it was a way to visually um, eavesdrop on the conversations Amira had with her own son. Um, and also just the, the visual component that was sort of new, um, you don't see a lot that's really empowering for students is that there's very minimal drawing actually. Um, there's techniques like collage, um, and cutouts, paper cutouts that are superimposed on photographic backgrounds. Um, and it's just sort of mind expanding for students when they think about um, drawing doesn't have to be an essential component of visual narrative. Wow, that sounds amazing. You definitely have to read that. Um, yeah, yeah, it's interesting that um, comics doesn't always have to fit into the mold that you think it does. There are lots of things that you can that you can do with it. Um, whenever I do panels like this, where we're talking about comics for kids or comics in education, I, we always get the same questions. How can I convince other people, administrators, teachers, and parents, that it's okay for kids to read these things? Not only is it okay, it's great for kids to read comics and graphic novels and manga. And I thought, you know, that's not what this is about, but we might want to do a real quick greatest hits. If you have one reason, that you think it's a great idea for kids to be reading these books, what would be your one favorite reason? Jana? Because treating prose as the only kind of real literature is gatekeeping to disability, to culture, to a variety of obstacles that get in the way of consuming information, storytelling, that kind of thing. We often fall into the narrative that comics aren't real reading or they're a stepping stone to reading, but there is a visual literacy and an inferencing, an inferencing component. And there is abstract higher level thinking pieces to it that prose doesn't offer. It's a medium, not a genre. And I think that cheating our students out of taking in information another way. We do it with infographics all the time. We do it with Ikea directions. Why all of a sudden are we having a hard time when they're colorful and there's more than one on a page? So that was a super long answer. You said quick. No, but, I love it though. That but, was like power packed, that answer. Thank you. Does anybody else want to share their sort of chiveta? Um, well, J Jana really um, opened it up beautifully. I just love the way that you, um, it was concise, Jana, um, uh, laid that introduction. So I'll add that when we're talking about our students or our children, um, yeah, gatekeeping, not just what you read, but what you imagine as a form for how you can express your own stories um, and your own thinking and how you're processing what you're learning in any subject. Um, I found that when I've had my students study the craft of creating visual narratives and then apply those tools and devices in their own storytelling, um, they've been able to express truths about their lives um, and about their thinking, which is often a very messy process when you're acquiring new learning um, in ways that they were never able to do before in pure prose, poetry, journal writing, any other medium. So if we want our students to be brave writers and thinkers, why would we gatekeep the tools available to them? Awesome. Thank you so much. Does anybody else have anything they want to add? Christina? I will say as a former English teacher, one of the things that immediately sold me, um, sold me on it before I became a librarian, when I was think, approaching this as a classroom English teacher, was the ability to convey tone and mood. That is, and I taught freshman English for 14 years. And that is such a difficult concept for students to get. As freshmen in high school, they are right there on the cusp 
of moving from being concrete thinkers to abstract thinkers, and they can get there with pushing in enough support. Um, but you have to have something that's within their instructional level and not at their frustration level. And tone and mood are such difficult concepts for them to wrap their minds around. But having a visual breaks that down and makes it so much more understandable for them is just having that visual component. From a teaching perspective, that was huge. This was a concept I'd spent years chipping away at and only being marginally successful with a small portion of my students. So to see leaps and bounds in large amounts of students being able to get that, I was sold. And then from there, it just opened the door to so many other things that could be taught with. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? Uh, mine is just like a simple statement, <laughs> which is like, kids want to read it. They, they want to read graphic novels, comics, and manga. So I'm going to make sure that that happens because when I know when I read, I feel good when I read and then I want to read more and it just becomes a part of my life. And that's what we want for kids. We want kids to feel good about reading and then they're going to read more. To be honest, the kids that are in the library the most, reading the most, checking out books the most, talking about books the most are the kids that are reading graphic novels, comics, and manga. So why not just like fill that passion like in every possible way I can at school, like making sure that there's some reading lists include graphic novels, comics, and manga, and there's supplemental reading lists that align with the curriculum, and they're independent reading lists, and at the book fair, and it just, they're just everywhere, it's just a part of the culture, it's just what we do, and then kids feel good and want to read. Thanks. Yeah, the choice and, and passion is, is a real big, uh, a real big selling point for sure. If, if I could just add to what Christina said earlier, um, I had mentioned that I, I work in a predominantly Hispanic area. Many of the students that I have are first generation uh, students who come directly from Mexico. So when we're speaking in terms of literacy, so much of the content is not easily translated. And I have a real hard time trying to translate those idioms, you know, or those similes, but through graphic novels, it exposes them through illustrated narratives, art techniques, word choices, and they can see it visually. And I think it's just important for educators to realize and kind of break out that misconception that, you know, that the format has changed so much in these recent years and what began as a medium to promote political propaganda, right, is now evolved into an immersive and engaging way to not just entertain, but to inform, to encourage, to persuade, to empower, and just to explore our world in a different way through this format that can be accessible and inclusive of everyone, no matter where they're from. Wow, you guys are, uh... The, uh, the passion is evident and the eloquence is much appreciated. That's, that's excellent. Now that we have talked everyone into this and that everyone now really wants to go out and get graphic novels for their students, let's talk about how they can do that. You know, um, where would I look for those? What resources are out there that I can go out and find the right books for the kids that I'm working with? go with whoever wants to go first. <laughs> Anybody have a, a particular favorite resource or um, a favorite way to go and find things? Yes. So I, oh, what, I'm so let's sorry. Let's do Karina and no, let's defer to the librarian. Yes, there we go. No, by all means. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Um, no, I'm just loving everyone's passion here. So and I'm really excited that we have librarians on this panel because you are my people. But um, I always look to school library journals and uh, my favorites are obviously school library journal, book list, publisher weekly, definitely publisher newsletters that I subscribe to to get emails about upcoming titles. Uh, even NetGalley that gives librarians and educators free access to ARCs. Um, that has been a really great way for me to keep ahead of the reading. So I'm not waiting until the release date. And I can always, 
you know, toggle over YouTube to look at, you know, most recent comics and, and manga that's out there. And of course, I mean, I'm biased. I'm on the uh, Maverick graphic novel reading list. <laughs> so look to your state associations. Uh, there are committees of librarians and educators who put together these lists for you. And it, it is done out of love and it's a very passionate project, you know, because we want to make sure that we're inclusive and that we're including um, books that'll create a dialogue for everyone and, you know, nothing with a limited scope. But these are lists that I of often reference, even before I was on the committee, these are the ones that I look to to look for not just titles and fun stories, but to get familiar with the authors, with the illustrators, with the publishers. And if you are not already, follow them on social media because they have that information that you can uh, easily access to find out about upcoming titles or maybe even illustrator projects, author projects. Maybe they're partnering up with a, with a different publisher. I mean, honestly, that's been a great way for me to keep up with the trends. And I don't know if any of y'all have them, but locally, your comic shops, you know, shout out to Myth Adventures, my favorite comic shop, um, and your local cons, you know, your local comic cons. I met Joe Eisman at my local comic con, and when I went in for Morning Glories, I realized, hello, he does Archie Horror, and I've been hooked ever since. I was like, oh my God, I love you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but anyway, that those are just my little two cents that Gosh, worked for a, me at least. That is a lot of great resources. So Jana, or I can't remember who went, who wanted to go next. Any, many, many, many. Shvetta, I saw your hand go up, and then Christina's. Shvetta, go ahead. Oh, I'll go ahead. Yeah. So Jana. I truly, I'm so sorry. Who would you like to go? Just go. <laughs> We're good. Okay. Uh, I truly meant that, uh, Karina, to go first, just because you have librarians have such a breadth. Knowledge, so I've got my narrow little lane. Um, I usually go direct to the, which is the students, and they will tell me exactly where to get the books. That's this website, it's that. So few that I've used are Vooks, V-O-O-K-S. Um, they're not what you would picture as a true novel, but it's almost like the motion animated books. Some are classics like The Mitten, and then also, um, I believe they have some of their originals. And then another online resource is Epic Online because they have both books and um, both prose books and graphic novels in addition to videos. And there's the ability to create assessments within there. Um, and also Comixology is an app that it's kind of like a Netflix for books kind of thing. Library apps like uh, Overdrive and Hoopla allow it and Kindle Unlimited. If you you can not only get it through your Kindle, but if you have Kindle Unlimited, there's um, a fair amount on there that if you have a tablet or I believe there is also a desktop app that you can view the comics that way. And uh, there are some pretty ways to get to the digital version. Awesome. All right. Uh, let's go with Shavetta next. Um, I'll add that uh, it's um, I want to point out too that for those of us who are really immersed in in this world um, and been teaching with it or working with comics in libraries um, we probably would all agree that there tends to also be something that emerges in schools that resembles somewhat of a comics canon so to speak um, at least in the classroom at least in the secondary classroom like when you're looking for recommendations it's often the same 20 to 30 titles that get trotted out again and again. They've been vetted. Um, they've been uh, awarded various accolades from industries and um, experts. Um, so I guess I would just advocate for, for looking for titles um, at the people level as opposed to the industry level. So one way to do that is if you have read something you like, follow the author um, on their professional author social media site. It might be Instagram, it might be Twitter. Um, some prefer certain sites, um, but through just doing that, you'll find that they're usually the ones who are reading more obscure stuff or promoting new artists, new writers, new creators, um, and the stuff that they will uh, tweet and promote on their social media will open up a world for you there. Um, as well as 
um, Facebook groups. Um, I know a lot of people think uh, Facebook is for, you know, sharing photos of your kids and cat memes and things like that, but actually it's a, uh, you know, wonderful network professionally um, and for readers. So I'll just recommend some that I'm active in, the um, comic book teachers group, um, We Need Diverse Comics is a Facebook group, um, the ALA Graphic Novel Roundtable is a Facebook group, um, and also Graphic Medicine has its own Facebook group, the Comic Study Society, uh, which is more um, scholars at the PhD level sharing stuff about their theses, which are often very obscure, um, uh, has their own group. So these are places where you can connect with people and you can say things like, oh, well, we just studied this. I'd love to incorporate um, some diverse, new, groundbreaking uh, comics and graphic novels that aren't yet on the library lists or in Publishers Weekly, et cetera, who, who's out there creating new stuff. Um, so yeah, just thinking about the, um, looking at it as what it is, a really emerging and evolving field with new voices and new forms um, that you can get your hands on before they make the lists. Awesome, thank you. Christina, do you have anything to add? Sure, I'm gonna start by um, saying the obvious is that check in with a librarian, is that school librarian, public librarian, and if the librarian that you encounter and have the immediate access to is not a comics librarian, that's okay, there's still plenty out there. Um, so don't stop with that one, is that, you know, check some other branches, check some other campuses. Um, being here in Texas and a former member of the Maverick Committee myself, I too am partial to the Maverick list, um, so just kind of touching on some things that have already been mentioned, definitely the American Library Association also has a great graphic novels list, um, so check into that. Looking into your, uh, your local comic book shops, shout out to Bat City Comic Professionals, um, <laughs> so proud of them um, and, and privileged to have worked with them. So um, just kind of the things that have, have largely been said, one thing I've found in my work with social media that it hadn't occurred to me before. Um, it seems really simple, but if you are looking for more comics at that person level, as Shiveta has mentioned, um, once you find a creator that you like their work and you're following them on social media, go look to see who they follow. Start looking at their follows and who's following them. And that a lot of times will open the door to maybe some of those indie comics that you hadn't thought of before that hadn't made award lists yet that might be on the horizon. Or maybe, you know, they're just really great stuff that hasn't been discovered yet. And they're looking for, um, they're looking for fresh faces and fresh eyes to help get their stories out there. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to make a little bit of a, uh, I, I like what you said about librarians. If you come to a librarian and they're not a comics person, go to another one. I would make the same statement about local comic shops and bookstores. If you go into one and it's not what you're looking for, don't give up. Go, there's an online comic store locator. Just type in comic store locator and find another because there are so many stores out there now who cater to everyone. Um, so yeah, I would say that there's good resources. Keep looking. Oh, Tracy. Sorry, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, in addition to Comixology, there is also Comics Plus, um, which I know is now coming through schools more. I believe Library Pass has it. It's being offered through Mac and Via, as well as, I just forgot who else, another wholesaler picked it up as well. Um, so. Thank you. Uh, I, I mean, everybody already said everything I wanted to say, but I'm just, I'm going to make my quick little list. So I like to use Yalsa's great graphic novels list. Um, reading, right? I, I read a lot, so I know what I can recommend to teachers who ask me or parents who ask me or kids who ask. And I live in New York City and in Union Square, there's three bookstores in like a triangle of walking distance to each other. There's Barnes & Noble, Forbidden uh, Planet, which is the comic shop, and then The Strand. So you could just like do this triangle of walking around to bookshops and like checking what's on the shelves because these are visual mediums too and just being able to actually flip through them and see the art. And I also have in Manhattan Kinokuniya, which is the Japanese bookstore. And I love going there because those booksellers know 
everything about manga. So if I'm like questioning uh, a series that a kid wants, or if I'm looking for like a student likes this, what else might they like? They're just like ready to give me all the manga. Um, also Shonen Jump, which is the app for Viz Media. It's about $1.99 a month. Uh, students can just read all of the manga on there. And it's also good for librarians or educators if they have their own subscription, they can read the comics and uh, the manga themselves and actually see if it's worth uh, sharing, school appropriate, et cetera. Uh, I think that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Um, I just have to say, Jillian, that I visited the Kinokuniya in Austin, uh, I don't know, a couple of months ago. And that's exactly where I found the manga that I wanted to recommend for the Maverick list. Uh, for, yeah, for this year. So, I mean, I totally understand what you're saying because there are so many bookstores out there that are just so great that don't necessarily fall under the traditional chain that we come across. And it was so refreshing to see totally different titles on the shelves. And I was just in heaven. I was in heaven. So I'm like super excited that you brought up that bookstore because I want to hit it up again in the summer. I'm like su super excited. I didn't know they were, I just, I know there's one I think in Jersey and then one in Manhattan. I didn't realize that they were across the country. Now I need to investigate. I know. Yeah, they are. Yeah, there's <laughs> one here in Portland and yeah. there's one, a huge one in San Francisco. Um, yes. yeah, major cities are getting them now. Yes. Amazing. Awesome. Huge. That's exciting. That's super exciting. I know that um, we sort of have two things here. We have the physical media, the print books, um, which is what you're going to find a lot of times in libraries and classrooms, but there's also the digital media. And I know a lot of you have now um, told us about resources that you can get digital versions of what would otherwise be print books. But there's a whole world we haven't talked about yet, which is web comics, comics that are created just for the internet just for the web. So does anybody have any great recommendations on web comics, which most of the time are free for kids to read? Um, there's different platforms and there's different, does anybody have any specifically that they like that they think is are good for kids? Shabata? Uh, I know Webtoons is a common one used for uh, younger readers. Um, and then at the older level and for adults, um, online comics mags like uh, more uh, well-known ones like the nib um, and believer mag have been out there for a long time but a lot of their content is free if you just follow their instagram account they'll often just like if you follow the new yorker or um, any major publication they'll often give a lot of that away on their social media sites um, and it's really easy to do that with a web comic um, or a single panel cartoon which counts you know in this medium um, there's also a few others I found uh, recently that I have um, mined for, for new, um, new creators, like inkbrick.com, um, as well as uh, the, the poetry.com, which is actually a, another kind of genre of comics, uh, poetry comics, um, Pink Magazine, uh, this site called Positive Negatives, which is I think their subtitle is true stories drawn from real life. So it's, it's a lot of um, up and coming creators who are taking either uh, political events or personal experiences, news stories and drawing them in comics form. Um, Comicsbeat.com also more of a well-known one panel by panels and online comics, uh, literary magazine, all of them have, uh, I think some of them have subscriptions, but a lot of them have free content as well. Wow, that's, that's quite a list. I would think that most of those, not all of those, but most of those are probably for older readers, maybe high school and up. Yeah, I found a yeah, Webtoons is the one, one that I, I think is the most popular for young um, web yeah. comics, but I'll, I'll let the librarians uh, say more <laughs> about that. Yeah, is there anything anybody else knows of that uh, Shiveta didn't mention? I, I was just going to say, the only thing, I, I don't really know much about web comics. Unfortunately, I usually find out about some web comics once they're made into like the actual book format and, and I'm like this is amazing and then you're like this started as a web comic what um so that's that's all, that's all I have to say but I, I like that they're being made into print form because then that also gives more access to kids yeah. um, to read and I think in the age of memes you know I think you can just about find web comics 
anywhere. Like for example, Nimona, right? She originally began her comics, uh, Noel Stevenson on Tumblr. So, I mean, there's so many illustrators out there who maybe don't have the access or resources to maybe be fully published, but they're creating their art. And I think the great thing about comics and graphic novels is that it can exist anywhere, regardless of the venue. So uh, I think that's the majority. I mean, you mentioned webtoons, but for the most part, a lot of my students do turn to social media to find some of their favorite artists and uh, comic creators. And um, I'll check them out. And yeah, these these wonderful artists have huge followings and, and I don't see them published at the bookstore, but they're doing so great online. Yeah, Instagram comics is a whole thing where it's um, four individual panels and then at the end it turns into a four panel comic and that is a format that is just hugely popular and exploding on Instagram and that anyone could do. Your students could even create those for sure. Christina, I know you were ready to say something. I was just going to say that my two favorite have been collected into um, trade hardcovers, but um, Lovelace and Babbage, which was out quite a while ago, started out, and it's this huge tome. I don't casually recommend it to just anyone because it's it's not right. It's not for everyone, but when you find that reader that connects with it, it is amazing. And the amount of research that has been done for each one of those is just extensive. And so that's why I say it's one of those, like there's a lot of back matter and um, supportive research that goes with it. And so some people will be put off by that, but some people will connect with it and will love it and will run with it. I was somewhere in between, it got about halfway through and was like, I needed to have read this as a webcomic because I needed that broken down into chunks for me. It was just a little bit much. I recommend it to a student. I swear he read it in like one city. Um, so it's all about connecting with the right reader. But then also um, just Tilly Walden. I know a lot of her stuff started, I'm thinking about like on a sunbeam, I know started out as a web comic and she's just amazing. But again, like I said, both of them at this point have been collected into hard, uh, into hard covers. But um, that's-, Your, that's nice. Thank you, Christina. Your mention of Lovelace and Babbage reminded me of a format that is, um, it's not new, but I don't see it used up often, which is the interactive um, graphic novel or comic. So the Lovelace and Babbage book has an iPad app and within the comic, there are links. And when you touch them, it opens primary sources, interviews with the creators, videos it's amazing and there are some other there are several i've seen like this there's a, a book called operation ajax which is a free app graphic novel and again it, it's about um it's about the american involvement in the Iranian revolution and it it has links right embedded within the page primary sources letters documents um, videos all those sorts of things and then i was just looking at one the other day i oh, wish i could remember the name of it but it's a uh Lee Francis, uh, oh, it's called Ghost, Ghost River? Ghost River. Ghost River. Yeah. And that's another one which you can read free online at their site. And it has all of these great things embedded right within the pages. So look for those kind of things. Once you've seen a print version or a, or a regular digital version, check out the author's website to see if there's anything else because more and more people are starting to do that too. My educator heart beats faster at the idea of the primary resources being right there and interactive on the page. That is exactly that's a whole lesson plan by itself. That's a whole thing. And and that sort of leads me into the next thing I wanted to talk about, which is, um, you know, comics and graphic novels and manga are there for kids for enjoyment and for reading, firstly. And a lot of times people will use them for literacy. So we're talking about in the English classroom, whatever. But what about science and history and these other subjects? Are comics good for that? Can we teach through them? And if so, how do I find the right pieces to use to teach in the subject areas? Does anybody have anything in particular? Janet? I think comics are uniquely lent to support the, the science and history because that is sequential art, that is a series of images, of events, of stages, if we're thinking about the light. I mean, think about how you learn the life cycle of a plant, that's sequential art. Having the, so I think that, while well, I'm very excited about this, um, more acceptance of graphic novels and comics and education, I don't think we've ever been all that far from using those kind of visual supports 
And um, something I read in the book was over there. That's why I'm looking. Um, it's not there anymore. But in a teaching visual literacy book was what you get is what you see. So what you understand and conceptualize and is some what you can understand is what you can visualize. So when we're talking about getting information from prose text, we have to recognize the letter. We have to know what sound it goes with in the context of that. We have to do all the decoding pieces. And if it's English, you got 44 sounds to figure out and silent letters. And oh, it's just a nightmare. I'm glad it's my first language. And that's exhausting, especially in that early, early reading stages. If you can get the concept across with an image, efficient is that and how much more energy that student then have to make connections to previously learned material and how much easier is it for a student to express their understanding if they don't have to worry about either verbalizing it which again like Karina said about having uh, English language learners you know having to you know do everything on hard mode because they have to new, do new material in their second language that's that's gatekeeping at its highest so being able to perhaps draw the life cycle or of events could provide um, alternative assessment. So I don't think it's super far from things we've already used, um, but I am looking forward to them, like you said, Tracy, moving beyond just the, this is a piece of literature, but with pictures. Does anybody have anything else about using it in other subject areas or other, yeah, to teaching with other content? Should I say? Uh, yeah, building off of um, all of that stuff Jana said, exactly. Um, well, so Jay Hostler is one of the most well-known uh, science comics writers um, who's written exactly like some of the examples we just heard about, but like the life cycle of the bee or um, uh, the honeybee collapse disorder, I'm forgetting the, the name, but um, uh, evolution and uh, big, big topics, part of any science curriculum standards um, he's written about through story form. So um, the what you kind of get as an added bonus, as opposed to just teaching, um, teaching a scientific process or phenomena through visuals that are more like diagrams um, that you might also find in a traditional science textbook, but the story element that comics allows um, to add to the process so that you can um, visualize more than, than just the how and what components, but also like, for example, if you're learning about a virus, a story allows you to think about things like consequences, um, th about the impact on various societies, different subgroups and subpopulations and demographics. And then it allows you to ask questions like, well, if this element were changed, if this was placed in a different setting or in a different time period um, or with a different group of people, um, how would that have impacted the virus uh, and how it spread or how it was cured um, or how it started? So just that story element allows science teachers to do what they're often struggling to do, which is get to the bigger picture behind the process um, that is memorized or diagrammed or uh, lectured about and then um, repeated or mastered, but you know, what are the bigger implications of how we live with science? And then in, if you're teaching that way, then your students are also using that medium to express what they're learning about the scientific concept. And I know Jay, in an interview I did with him, he funnily says, I quote him all the time, you know, there's no better way to find out what a student knows than to have them draw while they explain it to you. Because if they're telling you about the digestive system or some kind of bodily system and they draw the liver in the arm, you, you know that they don't get it. <laughs> you know what you need to review. Um, and so there's tremendous power in just learning what people think um, and how they're processing what they're learning if they use the medium themselves to express it. One of, my, oh, one of my favorite series um, is called Science Comics by First Second. And it's amazing. They have these small, these uh, very small books that all have to do with different aspects of science, but they are designed to be a gateway into um, a, a hard science area or an area of hard science. 
And I love them from a teaching perspective. I, I love them for just leisure reading in general, but as a teacher as well, I love them because one of the things that I often found the hardest is how do you introduce a topic um, or how do you introduce the subject area that you're studying? And when your students aren't necessarily automatically engaged, how do you draw them in? And so I love the fact that these, um, these small works provide an entertaining and interesting uh, perspective into a specific area. And from there, you can use it to launch and to, to head in. And I've stocked them in my library. I'd actually bought everything possible that we could get our hands on in a library bound collection and had them on the shelves just for leisure reading. And one point we actually put them out as a display and a couple of our kids just became junkies. They loved it. They were reading everything. I probably should have phrased that differently. Um, <laughs> They were reading everything that they could get their hands on, and then they would come back and tell me they enjoyed reading it, and it even um, encouraged them to do further research on their own. They were now interested in a subject that maybe they had just had to study in their science class, and they were like, oh, wow, this was really cool. Um, and so now I've thought about looking into it further. I've started a conversation with my science teacher. I've pursued that because I actually want to have that knowledge as opposed to I'm being forced to learn it. Yeah, and I really appreciate that those books are created. They pair the creators with experts. Um, so everything is definitely vetted and, and you can count on it. They also have a history comic series now, which is fantastic. Yeah. Anything else about uh, content through comics? Uh, well, just to kind of go with what Christina says, because, you know, we're from Texas, our eighth graders <laughs> are tested in U.S. history. So something that's been very popular, aside from science comics, is Nathan Hale's Hazardous Tales. I cannot keep those on the shelves. And it's a great way for me to collaborate with my social studies teacher and say, okay, you're talking about this specific person, or maybe it made a reference briefly. Imagine all of the background knowledge that the student's going to have when they walk into your classroom at the beginning of your unit. So what I try to do is often as I can is collaborate with the teachers and say, okay, what is it that you're working on and whatever resources I have, and especially if there's a graphic novel that's related to it. Um, and I know we're talking about science and, and history specifically, but even with ELA, you know, I have a graphic form of uh, Edgar Allan Poe poems. I mean, honestly, you're there as part of a partnership, right? And the fact that now we're extending comics to reach different content areas just gives you an opportunity to model what it's like to fully integrate this format successfully and giving other people the confidence to do it as well. I, I guess just one thing I wanted to add was um, a lot of teachers asked me to help them create supplemental reading lists. So our school is very collaborative. Uh, the grade team works together to build the curriculum. So things that they're learning in science relate to things they're learning in history, math, and English. So I'll create these lists for them, always including graphic novels. And some that we've included already was uh, Illegal, which is about the uh, immigrant experience. And then they call this Enemy, which is about the Japanese internment camps. And I'm waiting for my opportunity to drop When Stars Are Scattered, which is about the refugee experience, on somebody's list. So I, I just collect these books that I know are going to be amazing for student learning experiences. And I like keep them over here in a little box. So when I get asked, I am ready with these titles. Uh, also, Cells at Work, which is a manga series. Uh, that hasn't been used in the curriculum yet, but it should because it's all about learning about the human body. And I read that series just not even knowing that some of these things are happening inside me. So even as an adult, you're still always learning something new. So there's a lot out there. Yeah, excellent. I'm glad that you mentioned uh, that one. That's a, that's a great series. It's also an anime, so you can watch it in more than one format, which is always nice. Um, so we've talked a bit about how to find books and how to find books for content. What, what, what would you advise to someone, say a parent who comes in and says, 
my fourth grader loves Amulet by Kazuo Kibuishi. Loves has read them all and is looking for something else to read. How what how do you handle requests like that? Because I hear that kind of thing all the time. What, how do you find that the next book for a kid who likes something in particular in the graphic novel area? Kind of a little. I don't know, it's, it's my dirty little secret really, um, is that when people come up to the circulation desk and they're like, I love such and such, I love Amulet, can you recommend anything else? I immediately open up Google, pull up Goodreads and will search looking for books similar to, and you will get an entire listicle. And you can often see, and usually it has the reviews as well. You'll get star review rating, average, but then you can also see reviews, many of which are written by um, literacy professionals. They may be written by teachers, they may be written by librarians, they may be written by, you know, other people in that area. Sometimes they're just written by fans who, you know, enjoyed it, read it, whatever. Um, but you can see reviews and you can see the things that they suggest to read and why they're similar. Um, and I would love to say as a librarian that I am just amazingly blessed with all of this knowledge and that I can just always pull it off the top of my head. Um, but that would be such a lie and, and a pile of hooey. So <laughs> that is that is my dirty little secret. I like to use that as my professional tool. Um, there are some others, but that is the one I recommend just because it's so user-friendly in its interface. I mean, there are other things that are designed specifically for education and librarians, but really this is this is designed for your average consumer and the interface is fantastic. There's a there's a website called uh, what should I read next.com that I link to my online databases and my virtual library and uh, anytime that the kids ask, you know, I like this one, what should I read? I said, yeah, what should I read next? Yeah, what should I read next? And they go, that's the name of the website. <laughs> that's the name of the what should I read next.com. And even when I'm placing orders um, through one of my vendors and I use Tidal Wave, uh, there's different, you know, other people purchase these. And even at Barnes and Noble, when you purchase a book, it'll give you the receipt and it says other readers enjoyed these books. So I try to keep myself aware of those different uh, little features. And I mean, maybe they're not completely groundbreaking, but a little bit goes a long way, you know? And most importantly, reading them yourself. You know, if my kids, I try to read, I mean, I can't really account for every single book that's in the library that was purchased before I got there, but at least I know that the books that I'm putting on the shelf is because I read them and I enjoyed them and I love creating and having book talks with the kids. So if I'm excited about it, they will be too. And I try to have little bookmarks that say, okay, you liked Diary of a Wimpy Kid, you'll like these books. You liked uh, Smile and Sisters, you'll like these books. Um, and there are so many librarians I mean, everywhere doing the same thing. And I'm sure that if you were to connect with them on uh, your, profession, your professional learning networks, librarians are willing to share, you know, if those are the types of resources that you want. Some of the things that I do is just, I use my space when I'm in the library. So if I have kids that come in during lunch, it's usually 30, 40 kids. That's a lot for just me, just one person. Or if a class comes in, our classes are 34 kids. So. I will pre-make bookshelves, book displays that I know that are like, if you liked whatever, you'll like this or the genre. Um, or I use kids in the library. So if someone asks me for a recommendation and I know somebody's read a similar series or something, I'll be like, so-and-so, this student is looking for, and then they just like go on a journey together. Or I have to actually get up and go to the bookshelves with kids. So it helps to trigger like the the memories of the books that I've read and it's like, oh, right, yes, you're going to love this because I can't remember the 10,000 books in my library, but actually walking over to the graphic novels or the manga, it's like, yes, that's right, this one, you're going to like this one. So just like moving around, using the kids, making displays, making lists, it's super helpful in the school library. I don't know how it works in the public library. <laughs> Uh, I want to also plug um, and mention Book Riot. It's an online um, 
website. I'm one of their writers and I know a lot of our staff are librarians and educators and teachers and uh, writers themselves. Um, and it's really kind of uh, runs as a, the articles are, are in the listicle format. So you'll get, um, and they have a thriving comic section on the site. So if you are like that question you posed, Tracy, um, often that'll be the title of an article on Book Riot on their comics page, which is like, uh, you know, I'm looking at it right now, but um, for example, 10 of the best gay comic books or, um, uh, five graphic novels for kids that tackle tough issues or um, graphic novels to read if you like The Ghost Bride. Um, so it's just a, a great, they're all very short, accessible uh, articles. And also what's unique about it compared to a lot of other um, literary mag websites like it are that the recommendation lists all um, have to meet pretty strict criteria in terms of diversity. So you're you're guaranteed if you if you look at those lists, you're not going to see uh, one demographic heavily represented. You're going to get a, a, a range. Awesome. Yeah, I think it's um, sometimes that's an issue too. And I and I do have people ask me that question: How do I find books, especially graphic novels, because of the visual component where my kids see themselves? Um, you know, how can I find? books that they will relate to because they, you know, they see themselves in the book or conversely, how can I find books where kids see kids who are not like them, that can open them up and, and to see other things. And I think in a graphic novel, it's, you know, it's, it's particularly important because it is so visual and you can see the characters right there in front of you on the page. I know um, well, we need diverse books and we need diverse comics um, are really good at, at you know, giving lists and, and helping out with finding things like that. Is there, are there any other things that um, anybody would recommend to, to help out with that? Or is it just look at everything and, and, uh, and see what you can find? I know Book Riot, that's a really great tip. Gotcha. There are, I, I know you, we've talked about this before, Tracy, but there's a few databases out there um, that are new. And so they're, they're developing and evolving, but if you stick with them and bookmark them now, you know, I know in a few months, um, they're going to be even more robust, but there's one called cartoonistofcolor.com, um, queercartoonist.com, disabledcartoonist.com, um, that there's probably others, but um, those are some, the, they're online databases, so they direct, they don't have the comics, but they'll direct you to sources and names and uh, lists and uh, things like that. So that's one one thing to bookmark now. Yeah, yeah. And they're searchable, which is great. You can find, you know, the age level that you're looking for. If you want to do kids comics, you can put that in there and, and that's helpful. Anything else? I also just want to add that all of the reading lists from the Texas Library Association, um, it is built in as part of the priority as far as as librarians that are sitting on those reading lists, you are trained and supported in ways to make sure that you are reading outside of your personal genre, that you are being inclusive in the recommendations that you make when you're looking at it. Um, I've only been on the Maverick reading list in the past. However, as the social media manager, I get to see more of a global perspective because I get to see all of the lists that come out. And one of the things I try and make sure that I do is as I promote them, I showcase different aspects of inclusivity as I promote them each month and say, remember our reading list. Remember, if you're looking for representation specifically in this area, check out some of these titles. And so I, I get to see the ways in which it is coming to fruition, not just having been trained and supported, but seeing it actually in the list itself. So I, I cannot plug that enough. Um, I'm sure that that applies to other reading lists as well. It's just these are the ones that I have experience with. I will say that, that that Mavericks is one I go to all the time and people not, not realize there are two lists. There is a Mavericks list, which is ages, somebody help me out here, what's the ages? It's like grade six to 12 or six it's to 12. older. Yeah. And then there's a little Mavericks list there for is. the younger kids too, which I think is fantastic. And I know that the association of, um, I can never get the acronym right, but it's the School Librarians Association. They have um, three lists, a K2 list, a 3-5 list, and a 6-8 list, which are really great too. Um, in addition to lists, are there any particular awards or awards programs that you guys put some stock in? Now we all know 
our audience might not know, but we know that the Oscars of comics is the Eisners. Um, and they do have categories for younger readers and they've sort of expanded those over the years. That's one place you can look, but what other awards do you think are worth um, paying attention to when you're looking for graphic novels and comics? There's the Excellence in Graphic Literature Award that is supported by um, Pop Culture Denver. Classroom, I believe. Yes, uh, I am a judge. I'm a jury uh, chair for that award, yes. I know a previous uh, judge as well. And so, yay. Um, and I'm trying to think, there was something else I had uh, in my mind. The Sybils, which I believe, I'm trying to remember what it stands for. It's the Children's Young Adult Literature Bloggers. It's something, and I've just it's forgotten. It's C-Y-B-I-L-S, right? Sybils. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's a good one, too. Yeah, the Excellence in Graphic Literature at EGLs was actually created um, specifically to bring attention to worthy graphic novels for kids. And it goes from um, children all the way to adults um, and, and to make sure that maybe books that aren't getting um, noticed in other areas are, are getting the attention that they deserve. So that's a good one to look at. Um, what about things, uh, you know, the, the biggies in children's literature? I know there have been a whole lot of books that have been on the Caldecott list, on the Newberry list, on all those others. Are there any is there anything you can think of in those that you would recommend, you know, specifically? It's, it's kind of hard to tell sometimes whether it's a graphic novel or not, right? Because they just talk about books. So I guess, how would you find out whether it's a graphic novel? I guess you would have to look at it. Yeah, probably. I know that um, coming from a, from a background with younger kids, I think a lot of younger uh, people who work with younger kids don't realize that a lot of picture books are really comics. So uh, Mo Willems books, the, the pigeon books and the um, elephant and piggy books, those are comics. They have balloons, they have panels um, and things like uh, a very old, old in my world book called The Snowman by Raymond Briggs, which a lot of teachers have used in kindergarten for decades. It is a silent sequential art graphic novel. Is there anything else anybody wants to um, bring up that maybe we haven't touched on yet? I know you probably have all these things in your mind and you want to get them out. Does anybody want to um, share anything else that maybe we haven't talked about yet? Tracy, I have a quick plug. You mentioned um, wordless comics mm -hmm. and there is a fantastic wordless comic by An uh, Andy Runton called Owly that I absolutely love. Sweetest little owl you will ever see, but it's fantastic and seeing um, how Owly, without the use of words, without the use of text, conveys these, um, some fairly sophisticated concepts. And to the extent that it has literally gotten to be a running gag in my household, um, that just what there was one panel. And I remember like, we'll, my husband and I will actually look at each other and we'll say something like, buddy needs gloves. Um, and it's just, it was this entire, um, it was an entire comic and I'm not going to go into all of it, but really just, it comes down to one panel and it expresses this very sophisticated concept um, to the degree that it has stuck with us and has been applied in multiple situations. And so I would like to plug that one just because I think Allie does a brilliant job of that. I would, I would give you a little update on that as well. Ali has uh, come to a new publisher that he, uh, his books are with Scholastic now, and he has added some actual text for the other characters, but Ali still speaks in pictures, in pictograms. So there you go. And they're, and they're in color now too, which is fantastic. So those are up there. Does anybody else have anything else they want to uh, make sure that we talk about or that uh, make sure that you share that maybe we haven't heard yet, heard yet? I, I some, something I've been thinking about is just the resistance still for having this uh, for graphic novels, comics, and manga in kids' hands. Uh, parental resistant, teacher resistant, admin resistance. And I was just wondering if anybody had any thoughts or tips or feelings about how to like break that down. Gosh, there's so many, so <laughs> many ways. <laughs> Serena, did you have something? Uh, no, I mean I. Same thing. I just want to say right on and preach to Jillian because you're absolutely right. When we think about the curriculum and we think about uh, planning, I rarely hear the inclusion of graphic novels or, uh, or manga, right? So 
I mean, a lot of it is pushback. Um, luckily, I, I mean, and I can't speak for everyone else, but my principal was really into Archie comics when he was younger. So he, at any point, whenever I add graphic novels, that's like his first question is, uh, are any of them Archie? <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> you know, like, you know, there's <laughs> other ones, right? Um, yeah, I was like, well, there's, you know, a new class. Um, but I would say, <laughs> I would, I would say in regards to, you know, maybe not everybody is as progressive, uh, you know, I'm in Texas, so everyone's very conservative around here. You know, the Valley is a little bit more liberal, but there isn't that level of understanding yet as to the major benefits of graphic novels and manga, other than maybe the librarians and the students themselves. But if someone were to object, I would say just make sure that you have a section in your selection policy. If you don't already have it, create it. And something that I love to do is to get the input of my students, like my library ambassadors, my teachers, uh, an administrator at least as part of a library committee. Um, and maybe we don't call ourselves a library committee, but informally, you know, anything that I purchase, I like to get their their feedback on uh, first. And, and I feel that 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 results in less pushback whenever I implement initiatives or programs like free comic book day or cosplay day, you know, because everyone loves a superhero, but comics aren't always about superheroes, right? But at least it's a great opportunity to say, okay, hey, you know what, we have cosplay day coming on, but you don't necessarily have to dress up as Batman or Superman. We have these other graphic novels and comics that you can reference. And when you give them that exposure, and I think that's what I'm trying to get at here is the exposure, you know, giving them that exposure, giving them those opportunities and, uh, you know, yourself just being enthusiastic about it yourself, you know, because the kids do want to read them. And as a librarian, do the work. Uh, if you are curious about it, there is the, um, oh my goodness, the, uh, the CBLDF, the comic book legal defense fund. So if you ever feel that there's pushback or, you know, you're getting censored, that website in itself is such a great resource for anyone who may uh, have those issues come up. Uh, granted that you've followed all steps and procedures in your, in your procedures and policy manual. But Awesome. Thank you. We're, we're kind of coming to the end of our time. This could be an entire panel of it could be a series of panels in and of itself. I will say that there are resources out there. Um, reading with pictures. We are in the process of redoing our website, but when that's finished, that will be a go to resource for um, any kind of research and rationale about comics and and why they're uh, worthy and of study um, and of use. Um, I have a bunch of resources on my website. I have a whole um, section on research. Right? There are research studies that tell you that comics are effective, efficient, and engaging. Um, so I want to thank everybody. This has been a fantastic talk. I um, want to give you an opportunity real quick. If you have anything coming up that you want to um, advertise or share to our audience, uh, would anybody like to do the shameless promotion thing? Well, it's not my promotion, but free comic book day, May 1st. So make sure to take advantage oh, of it. Oh, they actually just announced that they have moved it to August. Yeah. So to make sure that we can have in-person events at comic shops. So yay, go and look at their website and you'll, you'll see the date on there. I just saw that today. Yay, awesome. <laughs> yes, free comics. Everybody likes free comics. Anybody else? Shveta, I know you have a book coming out. Yeah, I'll plug my book. Um, so it's called ha Hacking Graphic Novels. Um, and it's it's for teachers uh, K through college, um, all subjects, as we've talked about today. Um, and it's for those who have already taught with the medium for many, many years, and those are who are brand new to it. So um, the, the special thing about it is it's, it's not just my ideas um, and thinking and experiences. I got to interview dozens and dozens of teachers across the country and world um, from K through college uh, for ideas and experiences. So um, I can't wait for it to come out this April from Times 10 Publications. Um, so I hope you check it out. A lot of the ideas we talked about today are in, in there and um, 
and more. So yeah, just and I would to... like to second that plug. I was lucky enough to to read some of the chapters ahead of time, and it is so packed with fantastic ideas that you can use in your classroom tomorrow. So, I second that. Does anybody else have anything? I know um, the Texas Mavericks list um, is something that we want everybody to look at. I think it's one of the more high quality lists that you can that you can look at. So I'm going to um, plug that as well for you guys. Anybody else? No, we're good. Oh, Christina. Oh. Okay, my shameless plug, one of the other many hats that I wear is I have the honor of being the co-chair for the Central Texas Teen and Kids Comic-Con um, hosted by Round Rock ISD in Round Rock, Texas. And so um, when Jillian asked earlier, as far as how do you, one way to combat pushback like that, it's a huge undertaking. And so I wouldn't recommend it lightly, but to see a huge, our librarians in Round Rock were already um, comic supporters, but really to see the district, the other district personnel, to see the community come out is that when we heard, held the first Comic-Con on Round Rock High School's campus, and it be, truly became a community affair and that we were um, lucky enough to be able to have it for three years. We're on hiatus this year with the pandemic. Um, the state of education is just, wow, well, that's a whole different separate panel. <laughs> and so we could not take on hosting a, a virtual con as well, but we look forward to doing it again next February um, when hopefully we'll be able to meet again in person. Um, but truly that has been one of the biggest things as far as turning the tide in our community is just having people to be able to see um, like-minded individuals that enjoyed comics for whatever reason and have them come out and support and see their, um, to see their people and to be able to have fun and revel with their people and to know that, you know, we are a legion and our foot is in the door. And so <laughs> that was fantastic. Awesome. Thank you so much. Anybody else have anything? I want to do a, a quick plug my website tracyedmonds.com i have a lot of resources on there in the resource section um, from title list and recommendations to um i have a, a piece in there about the common core and why our graphic novels common text uh, complex text as defined in the common core and some other things so you can find that there and then the last plug i want to make is for reading with pictures we have several raise your hands ladies uh reading with pictures board members here we're like i said we're in the process of updating our site but um we have a, a lot of really great um information still that uh, on there right now and we're going to be doing a fall comics event use comics in your classroom so watch this space and we will uh, let you know more about that so I want to thank everyone. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much. I will go through here and make a list of everything you mentioned, and we'll make sure that we get that list of resources out. Um, check the description down below the video, and we'll find a place for uh, putting all of those great resources that you guys left out. I appreciate your time, and thank you so much. Bye.